that will become our prayer this morning as well as beautiful sound by the choir. Take your Bibles now and turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 1 As we prepare our hearts for the Lord to speak to us this morning from his word, let's pause for a word of prayer. Father, I pray that in the quietness of these moments, may your Holy Spirit touch each of our lives. <coughs> Lord, so often we become so busy, <coughs> so many demands and pressures of life that pull at us. But Lord, I pray that in these next minutes we spend together in the Word of God, I pray that your Holy Spirit, in a very real and a very special way, <coughs> may speak to us individually this morning. Lord, I pray that your searchlight would be upon our lives. I pray that individually we may listen to the voice of God. Lord, I pray that your will be done in our lives. I pray that through the message and through this service today, that the blessed name of Jesus will be lifted up. And I pray, Lord, that when we leave the house of God today, that Christ may be lifted up in our lives. And if we need to make new commitments, I pray that you will make that very, very clear to us. And then, Lord, may we make those decisions that will count for life and for eternity. Through Christ, my Lord, I pray. Amen. In the ninth chapter of 1 Corinthians, Paul likens the Christian life to the Isthmian games that were played every two years in the city of Corinth. Every two years, the best of athletes would gather in Corinth for the games. Notice, if you will, in the ninth chapter, beginning at verse 24, Paul says to the Christians, Know you not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize. So run that ye may obtain. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, a crown made of ivy that passes so quickly. But we were in a race to win an incorruptible crown. That's eternal life in the kingdom of God. Paul says, I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, I have a goal, I know what my purpose in life is all about. So fight I, not as one that beateth the air. I'm not just throwing wild punches. But I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. If we are going to win in the Christian life, Paul says, then we must meet certain conditions. Conditions that are very, very similar to the conditions the athletes had to meet to compete in the games at Corn. Among those conditions are number one, knowing the rules. Know what is required. Number two, there must be adequate preparation. 
And that can be very difficult. Number three is involves strenuous effort. Anyone that is going to run a race must run all. Not enough to know the rules. Not enough to know what is required. It is not even enough to have prepared adequately. Once you're in the race, you have to run with all you have, a strenuous effort. And then finally, you have to be focused on a goal. Paul says, if we are going to win in the Christian life, if we are going to reach our goal and receive eternal life at the end of the way, then we must be like the athlete and prepare. Now, why is all of this so important? Why is it so important in living the Christian life that we prepare ourselves even as strenuously as the athlete prepares who is going to run a race? Why is all of that so important? It doesn't seem like living the Christian life is all that difficult. I mean, what do you do? You come and you say, Lord, I receive you as my Savior, and then you just kind of live your life along, and when the Lord comes back, you're going to receive a crown to be in the kingdom of God. That seems to be all that is involved, but Paul seems to be saying something a little bit different. Paul seems to be saying to me, if I am going to win in the Christian life, then I must prepare, and I must get in the Christian life and live as though I'm going to win. Run hard. Put effort into it. Now, why is all this important? When you come to the 10th chapter, part of the 10th chapter is written to show us why it is so important for the Christian to train and to prepare for the Christian life. Now, the first part of the chapter, Paul goes back into the history of Israel for some illustrations. Beginning at verse 1, chapter 10, verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant. You know, I notice when I read through the Bible, every time Paul says, I don't want you to be ignorant, it's because they are ignorant. Now, the word ignorant just simply means without knowledge or without understanding. You go through and read all of Paul's epistles and you will find every time Paul says, I don't want you to be ignorant or without understanding, it's because they are without understanding. And so Paul says here, brethren, I don't want you to be ignorant how that our fathers were under the crowd, under the cloud, and all passed through the sea. That's the Red Sea. And all were baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. And they did all eat the same spiritual meat. That's the manna that God provided. Verse 4. And did all drink the same spiritual drink? For well, they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them. And that rock was who? Christ. What a day it was when Israel finally left the land of Egypt and 400 years of slavery. What a day of rejoicing when they left with a mass exodus from Egypt. Not only were they given their freedom, but the Bible tells me that those people who had known nothing but slavery, when they left the land of Egypt, they left wealthy people. You remember, God said, once you go to your neighbors and borrow their silver and their gold and so forth, so that when they left Egypt, they left a wealthy people whose heart does not pound when you read the account of Israel camped by the Red Sea. You have Pharaoh's army bearing down on them from behind. There is no way to escape if you go forward. But God said to his people and God said to Moses, tell my people to go forward. And when the run was extended, the Red Sea parted. And the water stood up on both sides, higher than a man's head. And Israel marched through that Red Sea, the Bible says, on dry ground. The bottom of the Red Sea was not even wet. 
Our hearts are thrilled when we read that story and Paul's talking about it here. When they marched through the Red Sea. But I want you to go to verse 5. After all of that, but with many of them, God was not well pleased. For they were overthrown in the wilderness or they were destroyed in the wilderness. What is he talking about? These people who were God's people, no question about it. When they left the land of Egypt, they were God's people. They went through the Red Sea, their baptism. They were God's people going from victory to victory. But Paul says, but wait a minute. These people who were God's people, God was not pleased with many of them. Many who left the land of Egypt never made it into the promised land. The Bible says they were destroyed in the wilderness. Why? Why was God displeased with his people? You're going to find the bottom line is this. God was displeased with his people and they fell in the wilderness because, listen, because when they were tempted, they yielded to temptation. That's the bottom line. God's people who left the land of Egypt, going from victory to victory, when they met temptation, they yielded to temptation. God was displeased and God destroyed them in the wilderness. What were some of the things they were tempted with? Well, we're going to discover that as we go on. Drop down to verse 7. Verse 7. Now Paul begins to tell the Christians why God was displeased with Israel and what the temptations were. Verse 7. Neither be ye idolaters as some as were some of them, as it is written. The people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Worshippers of false gods. They were tempted to worship a false god. You remember this story well. While Moses up on the mountain receiving the commandments from God, the golden calf was erected. The people were tempted and they worshipped the golden calf. Are we tempted today to worship false gods? Remember, a god is anything that takes priority in your life. If you're not here for Sunday school this morning and the adult classes, you should have been. Great lesson on priorities, setting your priorities. But remember, a God is anything that takes priority in your life. What are some of, the, some of the false gods that we are tempted with today? What about material things? Financial security. There are many people, many, many Christians today who are tempted by this false God. Now, I know you've got to have material things to live. Nothing wrong with that. Nowhere in the Bible does God condemn material possessions. Nowhere does God condemn wealth. But when wealth or things become our gods, then sin. There are many, many people today who are bowing down, many Christians, who are bowing down to the false goal of material possession or financial security. There are many men and women who are neglecting their families, neglecting their children, neglecting their health to bow down to the altar of material things. There are many, many Christians who are neglecting their spiritual health, who are neglecting their Bible reading, neglecting their prayer, neglecting the house of God, because they say, I've got to get more. I've got to have things. I've got to do this. I've got to do that. I'm going to bow down to that God called material possessions or wealth. And remember, there's nothing wrong with those things. 
There's nothing wrong with planning for financial security until that becomes our goal in life. You remember what God said to the man who put all of his energy into worshiping that false God and prepared said, I've got it all made. And I said, wait a minute. You're all ready for life, but life's over for you. And there are many people today who are tempted to neglect everything that is precious in their life to bow down to that thing called material possessions. If I can get a little bit more, if I can live like so-and-so, if I can have, if I can have, and that God stands there beckoning, and we bow down and say, yes, yes, I will get more. Yes, I will have more. Yes, I will give my help. Yes, I will sacrifice my family. I will sacrifice whatever is necessary in order to get material things or material wealth. Now remember, those things in and of themselves, nothing wrong with it. But there is a tremendous temptation today for God's people to fix our eyes on false gods and say, well, it's so important. I've got to do this. And there are many who are bowing down to that God called mammon or that God called financial security or that God called money <coughs> to the neglect of God Almighty. That's what happened to Israel. They bowed down to a false God. And there are so many today who are bowing down to that God. What's another God that we bow down to? Pleasure. Nothing wrong with pleasure, it's great. It's great until the time comes when the Christian lives for nothing but pleasure. Nothing wrong with going to the mountains, going to the lake, going to the beach. I like to go all of them at one time, but, you know, nothing wrong with that. But there are Christians today that their whole life, and may they live, oh, Lord, help me get through the week so I can get out for the weekend, and I live to go to the beach. I live to go to the mountains. My whole life is, by every spare minute I've got, I'm going to put into that. I bow down to that. I live for the pleasure that I can have. I neglect all the things that should be important. I neglect God. I neglect the other things that I may live for this. Then it becomes your God. And when we are tempted and we yield to that temptation to bow down to that God, and that becomes more important in my life than serving God, it becomes a false God, and when I yield to that temptation, I've sinned against God. You see, the problem with many false gods is that in and of itself, it's okay. But it's when it becomes a priority, when I live for that. When my goal in life is to get to that and to bow down to that, it becomes my God. Another God that Christians are tempted to bow down to is that God called success. I gotta make it to the top of the ladder. I'm gonna make it. I'm going to get there. I'm going to put all of my energy into it, all of my time into it. I'm going to climb, crawl, kick, any way I can. I'm going to get to the top. I'm going to be a success. Anything wrong with being successful? No. Anything wrong with getting to the top of the ladder? No. Unless that becomes my top priority. Unless in climbing that ladder to success, it becomes my God until it becomes such a driving force in my life that everything else falls by the wayside. Many, many Christians have so fallen and so bowed down to that God called success that, listen, they've lost their families because wives don't even know where their husbands are all the time out climbing, crawling, digging, digging, getting to the top, but lose contact all over. Children don't even know who the parents are. Children go home from school or go home and there's nobody there because mom and dad are so busy. We've got to get to the top. We've got to make it. We've got to. We've got to. Now we're doing this for you. <laughs> now I'm doing it because I want the, the feeling. I've got it made. I'm at the top. Remember, there's nothing wrong with being at the top. 
But if that becomes my God, that becomes my goal, that's the most important thing in my life, becomes sin. Israel, God said, many of them fell in the wilderness because they were tempted. They were tempted to worship a false god, and they did. And I could go on and on today. There are hundreds of false gods that Christians are tempted to bow down to. Let's go on. What are some of the other temptations they faced in the woods? Look at verse 8. Neither let us commit fornication as some of them committed and fell in one day three and twenty thousand. They were tempted with immorality or sex sin. I don't even say a whole lot about that today. One of the greatest temptations the devil is using in our world today is the temptation to sexual sin. I mean, look around you. Everything you see is pulling in that direction. You cannot even sell toothpaste or deodorant or cars or computers or anything you can think of. It's all sold through sex. That pull, that draw. The Bible says many were tempted and they fell. Christians today are going to be exposed to tremendous pressure. And so I would never commit adultery. I would never commit sex sin. What about in the mind? Maybe not that way. Christ said, if you look upon a woman with, with lust in your heart, you commit sin already. You see, there's so much pressure. The people of Israel, the Bible says they fell because of immorality. What temptations Christians face in our world. Let's go on to verse 9. Neither let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted and were destroyed of serpents. What does that mean? That simply means when we become critical of God and try his patience. I can explain the best for you if you leave your finger there and turn to Numbers chapter 21. Numbers chapter 21. Verse 4. Numbers 21 verse 4. And they journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to compass the land of Eden. And the soul of the people was much discouraged because of the way. And the people spake against God and against Moses. This is what they said. Wherefore have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no bread, neither is there any water. And our soul loatheth this light bread. See what happened? They became critical of God, tried God's patience. God was providing. God was leading on. He was providing every day for their needs, but they became critical of God. It's okay to have questions, but it's not okay to be critical of God. <coughs> Are we ever tempted to be critical of God? Yes. The, the way to the kingdom of God is full of people who have fallen by the wayside. Because when things happen in their life they could not understand, and when God did not come through as they expected that he would, they became critical of God and fell by the wayside. There are many, many people today who at one time were living for Christ, on fire for God, but something happened in their life. They met some obstacle in their life. They prayed. They believed God. God didn't come through the way, he, the way they thought he should, and they just fell by the wayside. They gave up. And today they're no longer actively worshiping and serving God. They became critical of God. God knows what he's doing. We don't always know. Israel was tempted and they fell by the wayside. And when Christians, when we, we're tempted sometimes, we say, God, why is this happening to me? It's okay to have questions, but don't become critical of God. It's okay to say, God, I don't know what's happening. I'm scared to death. That's okay. But when we come to the point of becoming critical of God, and that's where Israel is, they were critical. God, why did you bring us out here? God, why did you do this? Then it becomes sin. 
We do not always understand how God leads, but I'll tell you this, if we're a part of the family of God and we've committed our life to Him, I guarantee you, He will always lead us right. But we are tempted, let's face it, we are tempted to become critical <coughs> when God doesn't work things out the way we believe that He should. Let's go on to verse 10. Neither murmur ye, as some of them also murmured, and were destroyed of the destroyer. Murmur. Become discontent. Have you ever become discontent or disenchanted with Christ? Have you ever become disenchanted with Christ? Now this is different from becoming critical. There are people who become critical of Christ. This other part is when we just become disenchanted with Christ. Disappointed. Disappointed to the point where it really doesn't matter anymore. You see, there are Christians who begin their walk with Christ and something happens in their life, it knocks them for a loop. They don't become critical of God. They just become disappointed with God. And it really doesn't matter anymore if they serve God or not. It doesn't really matter. I mean, after all, God's not going to do anything for me. They would never become critical of God. It just doesn't really matter anymore. There are many, many Christians who fall into this category. That it really doesn't matter anymore. At one time they were on fire for God. They were eager to serve God. But right now there are many, many Christians who fall into that category. Don't ask me to do anything for God because it really doesn't matter anymore. I'm happy the way I am. I'm just going to muddle along and just kind of float, drift with the tide. Listen, when you drift the tide, you drift away from God. You drift away from eternal life, but there are many, many Christians in that category this morning. They have tremendous talents they can use for the Lord. But you ask them to do anything for God, well, it doesn't really matter. I'm, be, I'm involved in this. I'm involved. I don't have time to teach Sunday school. I don't have time to. I don't have time to. It really doesn't matter anymore. What a temptation. What a temptation. That there's so much pulling that the time comes, we murmur and say, God, it really doesn't matter anymore. The time comes in your life when it really doesn't matter anymore. That's the time you better be hit this salt and say, oh, God, help me so that it does matter. Oh, God, do something in my life so it does matter again. Because when you come to that point where it really doesn't matter about your service to God, you're in danger. Great danger. That's why the scripture is given. Now, go back to verse 6. Go back to verse 6. Now, these things were our examples. Guess what? All the things that happened to these people in the Old Testament are examples to I need to look and say, aha, wait a minute. That's an example for me. To the intent, the reason, that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Don't crave after those things. I can look back and see Israel and God said, listen, all these things that happened to Israel, they're for your example. Look back at them. I was discontent with them. They fell in the wilderness. They never made it to the promised land. Wake up. Look at that. You're going to be tempted. Don't fall into the same temptation they did. Written for our example. Verse 11. Drop down verse 11 very quickly. Now all these things happen to them for in samples, and they are written for our admonition. The word admonition there means for our instruction. We need to learn from them. Upon whom the ends of the world are come. Now, after having said all that, look at verse 12. Wherefore? Let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. I think I'm doing pretty good in my Christian life. And let's go back and look at Israel. Are some of the things evident in my life that was evident in their life? Paul says you better take a close look. He that thinketh he stand, he said, well, I joined the church. I remember many years ago, I, well, let's see, I, well, I don't remember when, but I, I, I know I did sometime. I joined the church, and so I'm going to be all right. 
I'm going to be in the kingdom. Paul says, he that thinketh he standeth, you better take heed. Today we say, listen up. Listen up. Take heed lest he fall. Take heed. We're going to face tremendous temptation. That's why we need to prepare for it. That's why Paul spent all the time in chapter 9 saying, as an athlete, you better prepare to live the Christian life. You're going to face temptation. And you're going to fall unless you're adequately prepared. Look at verse 13. There hath no temptation, no enticement to sin. All these things were spoken of. No temptation taking you, but such as is common to man. Listen, everything you're tempted with, Israel was tempted with. Many of them fell to that temptation. No temptation. But such as is common to man, but God is faithful as he can be trusted. You can count on him. Who will not suffer or will not allow you to be tempted, will not allow you to be tested, but that ye are able. Guess what? If you have prepared, if you haven't prepared, you're going to fall. I mean, you sit down at a job and you haven't prepared and you get out here to run a mile race. You make it on one lap if you make it and your tongue's hanging out and you fall by the wayside. You're not going to make it. But if you have prepared and you have trained, you may not win the mile, but you're going to run and make it. And that's what he's saying here. God will not allow you to be tempted about that you are able, but you got to prepare. you got to prepare. But will, with the temptation, also make a way of escape. But guess what? you got to take it. you got to take it. What he is saying here is that you can win, but it's not automatic. He's going to make a way of escape. Yeah, you're going to face temptation. A lot of temptation. But guess what? God will make a way of escape, but you got to take it. Meaning Israel didn't take it. They fell by the wayside and they died in the wilderness. But will with the temptation make a way of escape that ye may be able to bear it. Guess what? You may not always be delivered. You may have to go through that thing, fight and scrap it all the way. Bear it. You may be able to stand up under it. God's not always going to take the temptation away. He may just simply say, stand up under it. Bear up under it. Going to be difficult? Yeah. But I can be trusted. I'll make a way of escape. You can bear it. But you won't if you haven't prepared. Got to prepare. No wonder Paul said that win in the Christian life we must prepare as diligently as the athletes who run in the race we can win we can win but it's not automatic we're going to face a lot of temptation in life there's a caution for us here as Christians we can all enter into the kingdom of God we can all receive the crown of life he spoke about in chapter 9 we can do it we can win God can make winners out of all of us. But we must remain true to God. It's a must. We've got to remain true to God. We must trust Him and live for Him. But listen, if you trust Him, you will live for Him. Trust Him. Live for Him. We're going to face a lot of hurdles, a lot of obstacles in life called temptation. They're going to be there. But if we choose, if we choose, and we adequately prepare ourselves, guess what? God will enable us to make it. He will. Many in Israel, now you watch me, many in Israel, when they were tempted, they fell. They didn't make it. The Bible says their bodies were strewn in the wilderness. They didn't make it into the promised land. They could have. But when they face temptation, they yielded. See, it's not a matter of whether we're tempted. It's what we do when we face temptation. And if you're going to face temptation successfully, you've got to prepare for it. Plan for it. Prepare spiritually for the battle we face in life. 
me ask you this morning in closing. Have you fallen by the wayside? In some areas of your life, have you kind of dropped out of the Christian race? Listen, if Israel, who went through the Red Sea and experienced the miracles of God, listen, if they never made it into the promised land because they fell into temptation, if we fall into the same temptation, we're not going to make it either. <coughs> we're going to be tempted. But if we fall into the same temptation they fell into and they didn't make it, we're not going to make it either. That's why Paul says these things are written for your examples. For us to learn by. In just a moment, we're going to sing a closing hymn. I don't know, maybe everyone here this morning is right in tune with God. Maybe you're spiritually alert. Maybe you say, well, all those say, yeah, I face those temptations, but I don't have a problem with it. I'm winning. I'm winning. But maybe there's some areas in your life that need to be turned around. Maybe some areas in your life you need to come to this on and say, oh, God, I need some strength. You see, the good news about the Christian life is if you fall by the wayside, you don't have to give up. You don't have to get. You can get up and you can come back and say, "Oh God, I realize I have fallen. Oh God, I realize I'm not the person I should be. I've yielded to some temptation in my life, but God, I want to come back. I want to get into that race again. I want you to forgive me. I want you to put me on the right path again." And He will. He just waits for us to come and say, "God, I need you." Is that hard? You bet your life it is. And I'm going to show you how hard it is in just a moment we sing the closing hymn. If God by His Spirit speaks to your heart, you're going to see how tough it is to step out and come to this altar. God may speak to some and it's too hard. You won't step out and you won't come. But remember this. If God by His Spirit speaks to your life, it's only because He wants to lift you up. Strengthen you. The moment we sing, the Holy Spirit moves in your life. I'll just step out and come and let's pray together. <coughs> Father, I am grateful for the Word of God. Thankful, Lord, that you do speak to us by your Word. I pray now, Lord, in these closing moments, may the Spirit of God speak to our lives. Lord, temptation is there. We all face it. We all do. And Lord, it's so easy, as Israel discovered, to fall by the wayside. But I'm so thankful that you've given the word. You've shown us that if we fall down by the wayside, if we but get up and lift out our hand, you're there to give us a new beginning, a new strength. Father, speak just now. And as you speak, may we respond. In Jesus' name. <coughs> Amen.